Hi folks and welcome back to the channel. Pin Out Reports here and today I'm in a beautiful town called Rottenstall. And why am I in Rottenstall? Well, I'm here to tell you the story of Rottenstall's first ever murder and who it was by and what happened. And it's a well and truly fascinating story. Now, Look at, look at this beautiful graffiti behind me. I'm in an alleyway and it's, it's beautiful. Look at it. The red roses. So, I'm in Rottenstall and um, this is the second time today I've been here from Preston. What happened is I come here this morning. I left my house at half 7 a.m. I came to Rottenstall. It was pouring down. So I had to sit in the car for about an hour and it wouldn't stop so then I decided to buy a brolly so I bought a brolly from Asda cost me £10 and I bought a brolly and then um, I realised I don't have my gimbal so I couldn't film so I had to go all the way back to Preston and drive all the way back to Rottenstall to bring you this incredible film so I really hope you enjoy it. So let's go. Let's learn about Rottenstall's first ever murder. On August the 29th, 1948, an elderly woman was found battered to death on the streets of Rottenstall, here in Lancashire. This would become the town's first ever recorded murder in history. The murder shocked the whole town, but what was more extraordinary was the person who committed the grisly and sudden murder. This is the story of Margaret Allen, also known as Bill, who battered an elderly woman to death with a hammer and who spent their entire life trying to find out exactly who they truly were. Margaret Allen was born here on Plantation Street in Rottenstall in 1906. England was a smog of industrial coal, mills and factories. Society was very much segregated between the rich and the poor. And whilst everyday organisations like the NHS and the social welfare system would not exist until Margaret had grown into an adult. Now, Margaret didn't have the best start in life, but it was typical of the time and the place that she was born here. Just a typical upbringing. Margaret grew up as one of 22 siblings in a large Catholic working class family. Margaret was the 20th, 20th child out of 22. So it's fair to assume that Margaret was one of the forgotten children right at the bottom of the pack. So from an early age, Margaret was, for want of a better word, unsure of who she was. She probably would have been considered a tomboy in those days. But inside, uh, she was struggling to define her own gender. She spent a lot of time rejecting any femininity in her life and began acting as a man. Margaret's aggressive actions may have been a deliberate attempt for her to become a man, adopting archetypal male qualities that she believed would result in her being viewed as a man. The other explanation could be more straightforward, that her confusion and misunderstanding over her own gender 
was affecting her so much that she had to put up a robust and hard defence against those around her. Especially growing up in a strong working class Catholic family and at a time when society was far more, uh, far less forgiving against folks with gender identity issues. Either way, her anger began to deepen as Margaret the woman became Bill the man. In 1935, Margaret Allen had told people that she checked into a, a hospital to have a delicate operation. Margaret was henceforth known as Bill, with Bill claiming that the operation he had gone in for had changed him from a woman into a man. The Bill's claim that he had undergone gender reassignment surgery are quite possibly a lie, as such surgeries were only first attempted but unsuccessfully in Germany just five years prior to this. And any kind of surgery, surgery like this was not performed here in the UK until 1951. Sex changes were not a widespread thing and certainly not in rural Lancashire where most of the population remained resolutely Catholic. But that didn't stop Bill. And from that day, Margaret was no more. Bill wore his hair short. He wore men's clothes. He started drinking in the working men's clubs and bars, both largely inaccessible to women. Bill had no women friends except one, a Mrs Annie Cook. Bill's closest friend was a Miss Annie Cook who lived here at number 15 Union Terrace. Bill saw Annie as a potential girlfriend but their relationship hit a stumbling block when Bill took Annie away on holiday to Blackpool. Bill asked Annie to be intimate with him and whether Annie simply had no interest or didn't see Bill as a real man, she refused and appeared deeply offended by the whole incident. This didn't end the, relation, uh, the friendship completely, but it just increased the pain in Bill's heart furthermore. And this is Annie's old street, Union Terrace. Bill worked as a bus conductor for Rottenstall Corporation buses in 1942 during the war. A job that saw his violent and aggressive attitude get the better of him. The bus conductors during the wartime, they were, they were also known as clippies, you know, because they click your ticket. But sadly, the year after starting work for the bus corporation, the bus company in 1943, things get worse for Bill when his mother sadly died, pushing him headlong into several bouts of bleak depression. Bill continued to work for Rottenstall Corporation buses, but the company would apparently frequently receive complaints from abused and victimised passengers about Bill. So if if passengers didn't take their seats quickly enough or if passengers were running slightly late for the bus and they almost missed it, they would receive not only a ticket for their journey but also verbal and sometimes physical abuse from Bill with regards to their tardiness. Bill had no patience for anyone. His outward appearance both Physic physically and mentally displayed only the negative characteristics of his male 
counterparts. And Bill was sure to express these to his fullest potential. Nobody showed Bill any compassion. So why should Bill show it back? But on that basis of those complaints from customers against Bill, whether they were true or whether they were false, in 1946, the corporation company, the bus company, fired Bill. And now Bill was out of a job. Bill was hit hard by the death of his mother and the loss of his job on the buses and he became more and more withdrawn from life from social life his personal life and he, he just began smoking excessively refusing to eat he was unkempt and erratic in 1947 the year after bill got fired from the buses Bill invested all his savings and bought a dilapidated building which stood at 137 Bakeup Road which is right here in this empty space. What once stood here, the old building prior to that once served as Rottenstall's police headquarters here in the centre of Rottenstall town. Now, according to Bill's old friend Annie Annie Cook, Bill made several attempts to take his own life while living in this old house. As the depression got the better of him, Bill's depression, loneliness and sudden displays of violence and anger were all about to come to a head. Now, I was speaking to a, a local tour guide this, earlier on this morning and I met her up at the train station and we walked all the way down here together to this which is behind Bill's old house is the, is the Weaver's Cottage and the tour guide pointed out this here see this piece of concrete that piece of concrete is Bill's own threshold to his house so that's where his front door was that's where Bill's front door was. Absolutely fascinating. 68 year old Nancy Ellen Chadwick was by all accounts a, an unpopular woman in the town. She was classed as an eccentric, viewed by her own family as unusual and odd. She was known to carry large sums of cash around with her and often sat in public parks just like this one where I'm at the now and count her money. Now this park that I'm in now is called Whitaker Park here in Rottenstall. In 1931 a Mr James Crabtree, a stonemason who Nancy had previously worked for as a housekeeper left her four houses in his will so Nancy became very comfortable indeed. Nancy decided to rent these houses out uh, and thus becoming a landlady and every fortnight she would collect the rent from these houses amounting to two pound and fourteen shillings. You can let me know in the comments the conversion of that because I've had this wrong before. Um, now Nancy didn't trust banks so this was a reason that she always carried her cash around with her but in 1948 she was robbed of 25 pounds by a young man who attacked her in, in the town centre of Rottenstall. Despite her faults Nancy was rather wealthy but disagreeably tight with her money. If Nancy could spend someone else's hard-earned cash or not pay for something, she would. And over time, Rottenstall saw her as a bit of a scrounger. So Nancy first met Bill at the house of an acquaintance, a mutual acquaintance. 
and a week later they bumped into each other in the town centre, in Rottenstall town centre. Now as I mentioned before, despite Nancy's wealth, she was known to be a bit of a scrounger. So Nancy says to Bill when they met in town that she was out of sugar. Now bearing in mind this is a time of the Second World War and no doubt rations were still implemented and sugar no doubt a valuable commodity at the time. But Bill being nice Bill that he was offered to lend her a cup of sugar as soon as he could. He didn't have it then but as soon as he had it he would. Bill visited Nancy's home a few times after the meet after they met and although he didn't bring the sugar he didn't bring the sugar but he visited her again at 8.30 in the morning on Saturday the 28th of August 1948 and he said to Nancy he would have sugar the following Monday. So about 9.30 that same morning Nancy appeared on Baycott Road to where Bill lived, where I just showed you earlier. And she saw Bill and she asked to be invited into the home. Seeing obviously as Bill had previously visited her, she thought she could. Bill was not keen in letting Nancy see the inside of his home and shut the door on Nancy's face. So the very next morning, in the early hours, a Mr Herbert Beaumont, a bus driver, was taking home fellow bus drivers and conductors after a union meeting and all gathered at a local bus shed that once was along here, just along, along this front area here. And now this is a short distance from Bill's house which is just up the road there. So Mr Beaumont started to drive in the direction of Baycock down that way. A short distance as he drove, the lights on the front of the bus highlighted something. What looked like some sort of bundle just lying in the road. Mr Beaumont stopped the bus, he got off, he approached, looked at the bundle and realised it was a body. So he rushed back to the bus shed, like I say, it was along this bit here, it's all knocked down now. And he called the police. Two officers were on the scene quick. They cordoned it off and it was quickly discovered that the body was that of Nancy Chadwick. The wealthy, eccentric woman. Opinions of the general public first wavered as to whether she had been the victim of just a hit and run or if it was a murder. The police released no information initially, as they often do. But as activity increased, it was becoming quite clear that this was foul play. So police later determined that her wounds had been caused by a pointed end of a coal hammer. Detectives from Scotland Yard were called in. Bill reportedly followed the investigators' footsteps as they worked staring at them for long periods of time. Strangely, later rushing to a detective and alerting him of something that he had seen floating in the river Irwell. The object floating in the water was Nancy's bag, her handbag, the one she kept all the money in. And it was empty, except for some cotton and thread, you know, and three pairs of scissors and a pack of playing cards. But of course, the slabs of cash that she usually carried around were all gone. Murder was the cause, while the motive was very rapidly moving towards robbery. So who needed money desperately in this town? Who needed money so bad that they would be willing to kill for it?
1948, Bill was in financial trouble. As two years prior, Bill got sacked from the buses. So without a job, and presumably carrying a violent and aggressive reputation, he was unable to find further work. Now Bill was currently living on 11 shillings a week in welfare and 26 shillings a week in national health sick pay. Now this would have been the same amount received, by, received on one day's work by a skilled labourer in 1950. So he was really scraping at the barrel. Now Bill was also way behind on his rent, owing the landlord some £15. Now that would be a lot back then. And whilst being unable to pay coal or electricity bills, Bill was threatened with eviction. Now, all in all, Bill was in £46 in debt and he had no feasible means to pay this sum back. Now, now like I say, that's quite a sum for the late 1940s. So if anyone had a motive to murder and rob Nancy, Bill did. And things continued to get worse when the police come a-knocking. So guys, this piece of land that you see behind me, this is where Bill's house was. And this is where the police came knocking. So, when the police called here at Bill's house on September the 1st, 1948, when Bill opened the door, the police, they noticed bloodstains on the inside wall close to the doorway. A short search of the dilapidated building yielded enough evidence to convict Bill Allen of murder. Police searched the home further and found blood marks down in the cellar. The investigators also found matched hairs from the head of the victim to those found on, upon Bill's clothing and discovered several items belonging to Nancy within the house. The only thing Bill could do was confess. Now without a real explanation as to why or what the motive, this is what Bill told the police. Bill said, I was in a funny mood. She seemed to insist, Nancy, in coming into the house. I just happened to look around and saw a hammer in the kitchen. On the spur of the moment, I hit her. She gave me a shout and that seemed to start me off. And I hit her a few more times and I don't know why. And that was Bill's words. Bill was then arrested. And when Bill arrived at Rottenstall Magistrates Court for his initial plea, hundreds gathered. This, after all, was the first in living memory recorded murder in the town of Rottenstall. Bill in the court was referred to as Margaret throughout the whole legal proceedings and he was officially charged with murder. Now Bill, although being referred to in court as his birth name Margaret, he was dressed in men's clothes. He wore navy blue trousers, a check shirt without a tie, and a grey blue pullover underneath a fawn overcoat. He wore his hair closely cropped. At his full trial, despite attempts upon several grounds to prove him insane, Bill was found guilty of murdering Nancy Chadwick and sentenced to death after just five hours deliberation. Bill was sent to Manchester Strangeways Prison to await his execution. In a last minute bid to save Bill from imminent death at the gallows up at Strangeways Prison, 
Annie Cook, do you remember Annie, Bill's one and only friend? Well, she organised a petition. A petition for reprieve to try and save Bill from execution. At one point, Annie went to visit Bill at Strangeways Goal before his execution, where she reported that Bill seemed confident, happy, and thinking he would get a reprieve and he'd be saved from execution. Which is strange because it's almost like he, ha he hasn't acknowledged the severity of what's happened. And why he's sitting in, a, in prison with days counting down until he's executed. Sadly, the petition failed. Only 162 people out of the whole town's population of almost 30,000 people signed it. 162. Therefore, signalling the imminent execution would take place in the condemned cell of Strangeways Gall. Bill was belligerent, even at, all the way to the end. In his cell, belligerent, no caring, off the cuff. But on the morning of January the 12th, 1949, Bill, without expressing any remorse for his crimes, went to the gallows at Manchester Strangeways Prison. Without giving a final statement, he was executed by Albert Pierpoint. The prison chaplain, he was called Reverend Arthur Walker. And he quoted, Margaret Allen, Bill, went to her death like a man. He said she was a woman with plenty of grit and she faced it as a man would. She was prepared and behaved like a man. In fact, she had more guts than most men I have seen. The words of the chaplain. So there you have it, Margaret Allen, Bill, was a troubled and gender-confused individual. In more modern times, she would have been seen as a transsexual and could have sought the right support that she needed. But Margaret Allen was born in 1906 and lived in an age when people like her were just not understood. And Margaret becoming Bill was a brave and bold thing to do in those days. But in this case, had its consequences. Did the lifelong torture in her mind, battling with her sexual, uh, sexuality literally drive her crazy? Could this have been the catalyst that led Bill to committing the murder? His crime cannot go unforgiven, but it makes you wonder, had Bill had the help and support he desperately needed, would this crime have ever been committed? Who knows? So that's that's it guys, that's the incredible story of Margaret Allen, Maggie as she's known round here, and Bill, who he liked to refer to himself as. Now it's a sad story because Bill obviously had a heart of gold, but something led him to those drastic actions on that day with Nancy Chadwick and it's such a shame it really is so thank you very much guys I really do appreciate you all tuning in and I hope you've enjoyed this one I've loved being in Rotten Stall it's beautiful the history is amazing the people are fantastic and I've just really enjoyed the day so thank you very much guys you all take care and all the best.